Hey, just Brian here. Special introduction to this week's episode of Boston Art Podcast. Uh, Below uh, my audio, you should hear the faint sound of the club president of the Queer Art Club from a college in California reading the artist bio of our dear co-host, Theo, Theodore Earthworms. Uh, They had the pleasure, or this club had the pleasure of... uh, having Theo come do this really interesting art talk about, uh, you know, their art, about how queerness relates to it, because this was a queer art club, a presentation for a queer art club, so I guess it makes sense that you would talk about that type of thing. And, you know, uh, they also talk about the Letter Project and some other really fun and interesting stuff like that. So get comfortable. Uh, Get a nice... Uh, drink going, a cup of coffee maybe, and uh, learn a thing or two. Uh, and uh, here, I think Theo, I think in, in rare form as well, as they discuss their art and their life completely solo, uh, not interviewing somebody and not conversating with me, but just up at the podium talking. Uh, Theo was very nervous about posting this and thinking that it wasn't good enough or it was bad or it was stupid, but I think it was a very intelligent and interesting and really cool presentation about their art. So uh, this is the only time I'm going to talk for this episode, and I'm going to hand the mic over to this pre-recorded thing that happened a few months ago. That's all for me. Uh, Hell yeah. Thanks for tuning in to the Boston Art Podcast. Love you guys. Bye. Here's Theo. Yes. Um... So that's me. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, my name's Theodora Earthworms. My friends call me Theo. I make art under the name Earthworms. Um, I am 23 and I live in Boston. I'm in Boston right now. Um, so before I start, I did just want to say that I'm not getting into it in detail, but a lot of my work, as I mentioned, is process focused, which means it's pretty heavily informed by my experiences. So we'll be touching on topics um, such as interpersonal relationships, gender and queerness, mental health issues, um, eating disorder, and the coronavirus lockdown. So if anybody has a problem with that, I just want to let you know in advance. Um, again, I won't really be getting into detail, but it does inform some of my work. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now so I can show you guys my PowerPoint as I'm going. Um, Here we go. All right. So, um, this is me. Uh, So, a little bit of background about myself. Um, This timeline is sort of um, tongue-in-cheek, but it is true. Um, I've been taking art classes and I've been involved in the arts since I was a kid. Um, I was homeschooled and my mom, um, because I had the privilege of being homeschooled, she was able to stay at home. Um, we were a low income family because we sacrificed that income. So what she did was she volunteered at our local community art center, um, in order for me to start taking classes. Um, so I started doing that at about three years old and stayed there until I was about 10, took a break, went back in my teen years and never really stopped, um, through the community center, not through public school, because I was homeschooled K through 12. Um, I started showing my work just locally around my town um, with the assistance of a lot of my mom's friends that she made through that art center. So that was really amazing. Um, that was really the beginning of the seed of community being planted in my head, um, people helping each other kind of reach those milestones. Because if that hadn't happened, I probably would have waited till about college to start taking our classes, um, or maybe wouldn't have. <laughs> So I started um, selling my artwork um, or making it to sell um, when I was about 2010, 13 or 14 years old. I started doing artwork on commission in my teen years um, with the support of my parents again. I have illustrated two children's books. Um, They're called Baby Snap and um, Bedtime Storytime, but I was 15 when I illustrated them, so it's okay if you don't necessarily look those up. Um, (laughs) I... um, started doing my own work. I was doing my own work the whole time, but I started selling my own work, um, like t-shirts and patches and pins and things that weren't on commission for other people um, around that time, but started doing markets in Boston in 2017. Um, That was a huge learning experience for me. And I was really focused on product-based work at that time, trying to make money and things like that. Um, I wanted to go to art school really badly. Um, I was going to community college. Quincy College is a community college. It's a two-year university. Um, so when I finished homeschooling, I was matriculated there as a part-time student, um, which 
I started when I was 16 years old in conjunction with high school, so I was kind of already there, and I was studying fine arts and psychology. It kind of all happened, these were things that were given to me by my mom, um, the majority of them, my mom and my dad. So I didn't choose to start school, but once I was there, I just kind of really committed to it, um, and I really enjoyed it. So I graduated in 2018 with um, a dual degree, uh, two degrees, one in fine arts and one in psychology. So with that background, I decided to um, begin studying art therapy at Lesley University, which was all well and good until in 2018, um, I actually, in my personal life, was experiencing a lot of things that were pretty overwhelming. And because my life was so um, career focused and I was on such a definitive trajectory for so long, I kind of got really overwhelmed and started sort of veering off of my path without realizing it. Um, without getting too, too far into detail, um, I was a pretty restrictive relationship from 2018 to 2019. I moved to Boston with that person. Um, I was living with them without a friend group or a support system. I was struggling with depression, PTSD, a particularly bad flare-up of an eating disorder that I've had for my whole life. Family issues, substance abuse, and my attendance at work and school were failing as a result of this. Everything just kind of fell apart. Um, I came from a position of relative privilege and being able to, even though I was low income, having access to a lot of educational support, emotional support, and then I almost kind of took that away from myself in a lot of ways. Um, my work before this time was pretty, um, I guess, kind of out there. It was pretty rebellious. Um, I made some work about mental health issues as well. This piece um, is titled Dissociation. I made that in 2017. Um, so I was probably 19 when I made this. This was right beforehand. Um, and then this is another example. My work changed a lot um, in 2018. Um, I started to feel a little bit more exposed and didn't want to do things as much like incorporating the same amount of text or um, betraying as much about my emotional state because at the time I wasn't doing that with intention. I was just making work because I wanted to. Um, my work at the time before this in 2017 and 2016 before that incorporated a lot of text. It was often comedic or wry, poking fun at my experiences and exaggerating my feelings to make sort of entertaining visuals for an audience. Um, I usually planned what I was trying to say or I was making some kind of joke. Like I was really influenced by um, punk band posters, graffiti, um, DIY punk aesthetics and musical artists actually like Lydia Lunch and Death Grips and Titty Bats on Instagram if you know them. Um, so really kind of trying to draw attention to myself beforehand and focused on going to art school, wanting to be a famous artist. And psychology was just sort of an interest that I had on the side um, that I just pursued because I had a lot of credits in that field, honestly. Um, and then after 2018, I started to notice the change in my work. Um, oh, this is another self-portrait from before that era. Um, and I started to notice a lot of changes. Um, a lot of my work became really introspective. I was sort of telling on myself in a lot of ways because this wasn't an intentional practice. It wasn't really reined in. Um, it was still kind of nascent. I was a lot younger. Um, and it started to make me feel a little bit seen. I started having people ask me about things that I was posting on my art account and um, different work I was doing, asking if I was all right. So my work changed a lot. Um, in 2018, I also started my first semester at Lesley University. Um, so I was a sophomore at this point, but because I transferred in from another school, I got jumped right into a program of people that started as freshmen for the most part. It's a pretty small um, private art school. So I was there on scholarship. I was also working full time. A lot of people around me weren't at the time, which I'm very happy for them. That was great, but it had me very, very busy. And I just felt like a fish out of water in a lot of ways. It would have been a difficult adjustment anyway, but I'd also kind of cut myself a little bit off from the supports I usually utilized, and I was in a new city. So a lot of my work um, stopped using color as much, uh, a lot less text. Um, this image on the left is a drawing um, from life of the view from my fire escape in my apartment in Alston. Um, I lived in a studio apartment at the time, so there's just one main room that I shared with that person that I was living with. Um, it wasn't a great environment for me, so I spent a lot of time on the fire escape, honestly. Um, and this was that view. My mom actually bought this piece for me. Um, the piece on the right is a painting of a peace lily in a Cafe Bustello can. Um, it doesn't look like a peace lily because it's half wilted, which was why I drew it at the time. A lot of my work had this sort of somber feeling, and in my mind at the time, I was thinking it was me refining myself, leaning more into fine arts, which I don't even know what that means at this point, but leaning away from text, um, comedy, that sort of thing, and into something more serious and more emotional, which started showing me a lot about myself, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so t t the job that I had at the time, which was probably one of the best things that happened to me at that period of time, 
was at um, a museum in Boston. I worked as a membership sales representative at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, which was a position I didn't expect to get. I was really excited when they called me back, and I was juggling working there full-time with being in school full-time, which was difficult. Um, they were really understanding at the museum about that. Um, not so much in school, because there was a lot of pressure, but that's okay. And that ended up helping me a lot, because I ended up finding a community where there were a lot of artists around me, um, also in school too. And I kind of re-found my center and realized that the reason that I was making work and the reason I wanted to make work was to get more in touch with myself, find community, um, find my voice. And the ways that I was living at that time weren't allowing me to do that. So I kind of came to a crossroads that was shown to me through my work and shown to me through the things I was seeking with my work where I kind of had to step up to the plate with myself and value myself a little bit more to get the things that I wanted. Um, so in um, the beginning of 2019, I um, started doing therapy. Um, I'd actually been doing therapy for a few months, but my therapist convinced me to reach out to a group of my friends from work and ask them if there was a place that I could get alternative housing. Um, one of them happened to be renting a room in a queer communist um, pagan commune in Somerville. Very big change. Um, it was a huge moment for me in my own personal autonomy and leaving that relationship, leaving behind a lot of toxic things that I was intentionally engaging in at the time, um, and leaning into um, community, art, friendship, and analyzing my queerness for the first time in a long time, because I'd been in back-to-back -back heterosexual monogamous relationships until this point. Um, hadn't really come to terms with anything <laughs> about myself. I'd been openly identifying as bisexual since about 2012, but hadn't really explored that. Um, didn't really know what to think about my gender at all. Um, there's just a lot of, I had a lot of questions at that time, and I kind of realized that they were important to address and not something that I should shove under the rug because of this. So I started to feel really um, emotionally fulfilled by my work in a way that I never had before. It wasn't about making a product to sell or about making something for an audience anymore. It was about me and about what I wanted to do. And if people looked at that after the fact and found value in it, that's beautiful. But that it wasn't my job to show them that value. And it wasn't my job to earn that value. It was a practice, a therapeutic practice for myself. Um, I actually had a moment in school right before I, because I did take time off of school in the beginning of 2019. When I moved out, um, it was finals week of the spring semester, actually. <laughs> so that was a lot. Um, and on the recommendation of my therapist, I took a semester off. I haven't gone back yet. I hope to. <laughs> um, but yeah, it ended up being a lot longer because of the coronavirus pandemic and online schooling. Um, I admire all of you guys for doing that. But for me, I have a lot of internships I have to finish and it just the where I was in my degree, it wouldn't really make sense right now to go back, but I will be soon, hopefully within the next year. Um, anyway, after I did that, my work changed drastically, and that really fascinated me. Um, this is a piece that I did. I started going to um, art shows. I started live painting. Um, a lot of my friends were musicians. Um, I reached out to new people in Boston that I didn't know before, because I had not very many friends yet at this point in the city. Um, I'm only from an hour south, but a lot of my friends had gone to different states and things for college, so I was kind of planting new roots in this place. Um, I started experimenting a lot with color, um, bringing back text, but in a less um, ironic way and kind of a more poetic way. Not literally saying what I meant, but alluding to it. Um, this is an example of that. Um, this is another piece from around that time like compared to the work I was doing before, drastically different. A lot of people didn't even know that it was the same the same artist. Um, but yeah, I started really trying to reach out to my community and the people around me. Um, so what resulted in that was the Virago Collective, which I founded, um, I'd say that would be maybe the summer of 2019 with one of my roommates at the commune house that I was living in. Um, the intention of the Virago Collective was to essentially build community because I started talking to a lot of my friends and coworkers about the things I was thinking about and a lot of my experiences at that time. Um, and I found that a lot of them, even though maybe it wasn't as severe as the things that I'd gone through or maybe it wasn't as black and white as abusive relationship or dropping out of school or something, maybe weren't finding that support. Um, if you're not familiar, Boston, as much as I love it, this is my home city, but it is a very collegiate institutional place. Um, if you are an artist that is low income and not connected to an art school um, or doesn't have any kind of backing like grants or financial support from a family member or friend or someone who is a patron of your work, it's really difficult to find a place to do your work. Um, a lot of apartments cost, well, on average, like I'm paying 865 for the one I'm in right now. 
Um, it's the biggest apartment I've ever been in, and I've moved four times since I've been here. But it's on. It's expensive. <laughs> it's easily a thousand dollars just for basic needs every month. Paying for a studio space is not really an option for a lot of people, and that can be really limiting if you are an oil painter, if you're not working with watercolors and inks. Um, I was lucky enough that I typically do work with pen and inks, um, just in things I can carry in my backpack, but it really limits the mediums you can experiment with. Um, so, because I was living in a commune house, and a lot of the people that lived with me, even if they weren't artists, were supportive of the arts, we decided to create this collective together. Um, there was just a bunch of people that worked at either different museums in Boston or went to different colleges in Boston that were willing to share their institutional access. So um, we would meet up once a month. Um, this is We published a manifesto as well, just of things that we believed that kind of back up what I'm saying right now. This is an excerpt from it. It's available on, I could repost it on my Instagram, Earthworms. Um, the Instagram for this collective is no longer active. It's under Arts for Mutual Aid. If you're interested, the whole thing's published there. But Essentially, um, we would meet uh, once a week from 6 p.m. to midnight and essentially open the house to whoever would come, um, which is kind of crazy in retrospect, but that's what we did. And we just shared art supplies and a space. We had um, we were lucky enough that our apartment had two common areas. It had a big main room and then a kind of smaller living room that were connected, like open format. So we just put drop cloths everywhere and invited everyone to come in. And we did um, open critique. Uh, we did. We were teaching each other things. We had one night where we did um, live figure drawing with nude models. Um, we had one of my community members was um, one of my roommates, Lindsay O'Connell, actually did a unit on American Sign Language and made a whole PowerPoint and just taught a free class, essentially. And the whole point was supporting one another and giving each other access to things. Um, for a short period of time, we had people that worked at different museums. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you're a museum employee and you work the front lines, you are allowed to bring in a certain amount of people. I mean, before coronavirus, you were allowed to bring in a certain amount of people anytime with free tickets. So we had people that were willing to give their tickets away to people that maybe couldn't afford a membership to that museum. Um, just really trying to make it so that people that didn't have access to a college or to benefits from a job could still get those things and kind of experience the culture and the riches that our city had to offer. Um, and making it so that nobody wound up in a situation where they were just making work alone. So I think part of, I talk about this on um, my podcast as well with Brian Huntress, but I think part of the problem with product-focused art making, although it is totally valid, there's nothing wrong with doing it, I do it, I think everybody does it if they want to pay their bills through art. Um, if you're making a product to sell, you're thinking about your audience, you're not thinking so much about yourself, you're appealing to something. It's like making a post on Instagram versus just taking a picture of yourself as you are, or maybe just going about your day. It's not a great example, but... Um, and the problem that arises there is that you don't talk to a lot of other artists about the process. Um, when you are networking, you're giving each other business cards, you're showing finished work, you are sharing your product, you're saying... you're establishing your value based on what you've accomplished already. Versus in this setting, we were trying to create a place where, as we're doing in this picture, you can just talk about your work, show things that kind of aren't that good, and realize that the majority of the things that any established artist makes, if you make five drawings, four of them are going to be bad. You're not going to like them. Because you have to have those kinks of learning and moving through that process. And I think a lot of us limit ourselves by thinking that other people don't go through that. Especially, probably now, especially with majority of our arts networking happening on social media, you're seeing a finished product, not the process. So this was a process-focused collective. Um, this doesn't mean we weren't supporting each other in the sense of selling finished work, but the process was the most important piece for us. Um, so that was amazing. It ended up it w ended up becoming a real calling for me. Um, this is the definition on Wikipedia of what process art is. Um, it's an artistic movement where the end result of art and craft is not the focus. The process of making is the most relevant aspect, if not the most important. Um, Art-based research is a similar thing um, that I was I discovered while writing the Virago Manifesto that I thought was really interesting. Um, it's a form of a mode of formal qualitative inquiry that uses artistic processes to understand and articulate the subjectivity of human experience. So there are a lot of definitions for that. I'm not I don't claim to be an expert on that. But I took that idea and I rolled with it in terms of my fine arts work. Um, concurrent with Barago, in the beginning of 2020, I went to a treatment program at Arbor HRI for um, my eating disorder and mental health issues. And during that time, I studied um, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, and was also a patient of DBT. <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, I also had an art therapist at that time, which I'd never been, I'd been studying this for about six years, but I'd never been on the patient side of these things. Um, 
and it's funny how much internalized stigma you wind up having even being in that field um you don't think of yourself as the patient you think of yourself as the person with the answers and there is no person with the answers in fact the patient might be the one with the answers when it comes to something like art therapy so i started making a lot of work about that um removing it from a clinical setting to back up a little bit before i move into what happened after lockdown i started trying to really focus on harnessing that process of focusing on the process and allowing myself to make more work that wasn't good. Um, If you look back at my older stuff, a lot of it was pretty technical. This piece, I don't know how long it took me. I think it probably took about six months. I do have a habit of doing that, getting really, really stinking my teeth really hard into a piece to make it perfect, and it never feels like anything's done. Um, That's fine. I don't think that's a bad thing, necessarily. But it has prevented me before from finishing pieces. Um, I'd leave things in my sketchbook because it wasn't good enough or something wasn't right and it would never get seen. And that almost devalues all the time that you spent with that piece of work. So what I started trying to do is make more pieces like this, where, as I mentioned, I started doing live painting gigs where I would go to a show where there was maybe an acoustic band playing or something. And on a separate stage, I'd be painting as well so people could see me in my process. This is a piece that if this were in my sketchbook, I might not even post this, but I did it um, in person and there were people watching me and it was really rewarding to me to see that they valued that and really looking at the work and watching the process, which is what I was essentially performing, was the process of making. It wasn't about the finished piece. Nobody purchased it. It wasn't up for sale. The value was the process. Um, And I was kind of trying to show that to myself as well. So with that in mind... Then came 2020 and the coronavirus lockdown and everything that came with that completely changed my world because at this point I've been building a very nascent sort of practice for about a year of trying to connect other artists, um, trying to connect with other artists to learn from them, um, person to person interactions, sharing those like behind closed doors moments in person and suddenly everything was closed doors. Um, I got let go from my job at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, I was furloughed for most of the year, but they eventually let me go because in-person sales isn't really necessary right now with limited capacity. Um, A lot of things changed. (laughs) And we started trying to do Virago um, on Zoom, and it just wasn't the same, really, because you couldn't really see each other's work. It probably would be adaptable now, but this was, um, I think, the beginning of April, end of March, and it was just too much going on. And there were a lot of feelings that I was processing and a lot of um, connection that I was lacking. And what I turned to in that time was my art, because that was what I had been training myself to do, I guess. And there wasn't really a lot of other options. Um, So I ended up connecting at this point with Brian Huntress, who is um, another artist in Boston. They're also my partner now, but they weren't at this time. And they were experiencing a lot of similar feelings. We started making work together. These are four examples from this. Um in something that we call the Letter Project, which is one of my first large-scale collaborations. Um, Essentially what we did is that each of us made five drawings. Um, They initially were very simple, just like a drawing. They're all on printer paper. Packed them into manila envelopes and mailed them to each other. We'd never met in person. We hadn't really talked very much. Uh, We'd met one time for about a half an hour, I think, um, a few months before this happened. But we both admired each other's work and had seen each other's finished product. So talking on the phone about all of these ideas, we came to the idea that it might be nice to kind of exchange these images and just give ourselves something to do and something to focus on that had nothing to do with the rest of the world. Um, Because in the beginning of last year, that was, (laughs) you were inundated with all of that. Um, So we started doing that. And then once you exchange those images, we would scan them, document them, and then add to them again, or detract from them. Um, There were parts, if you can see on this image on the right, actually, the corner of it is ripped off. Um, Sometimes, as we started developing them more and more, we used the same sheets over and over again. I think at the end of the project, we had about 80 images altogether. Um, So 10 each exchange is probably about eight exchanges. Uh, We started burning them, cutting them up, um, rearranging them. This one on the left, I think, was cut up, sewn together, cut back up again, and then taped together on the back. Just doing everything we could to sort of kind of outdo each other, while also starting repertoire and communicating visually in a way that we wouldn't have been able to get to know each other if we were face-to-face or in person. Um, So it was really interesting. Um, If you look over this project which we will be releasing it in full as a zine or a book in the near future um, once we finish writing the prologue, um, you can see our relationship building in a way that I don't think either of us expected. Um, we didn't know each other very well in the beginning, and we were allowing a lot of empty space on the page, um, kind of making it easier for the other artists to jump in and do what they wanted to do. 
And then we started making a rule that we couldn't talk about what we were going to do. It was just a surprise. And you had to do your best every time. And it started becoming really competitive and really interesting. Um, these two right here are kind of... Um, we also didn't agree on themes for any of them, but they sort of emerged as the work went on. These two in the front are a little bit more personal, but these right here um, reference coronavirus, development of our relationship. Um, this is also the first serious polyamorous relationship that I've been in, and same for them as well. So there were some kinks in the beginning along that way that um, we worked out partially through this project a little bit after, but it does explore that as well. Um, so it was a really neat project to be a part of and really changed my approach to how I was sharing my work with other people. Um, and then back to my own personal work, um, I started trying to process emotion through artwork with real intention for the first time in a long time. Even though I've kind of been on the precipice of a lot of these ideas for a couple of years now, um, there was a crazy amount of change happening and uncertainty. And for the first time ever, I had been experiencing for about a year and a half to two years a bunch of personal issues that I thought was the end of the world, the worst low point I'd ever been through. And... Throughout all of that, there was somebody there to say, I've been through this, it'll be okay. With the coronavirus lockdown, that wasn't the case. No matter who you talk to, there was almost a sense of guilt of talking about it. So I went internal with it and started making work to document and work through those issues. Um, this piece on the right is a self-portrait, um, and on the left is sort of a still life. That's in an embroidery hoop. Um, this piece is actually sort of about my grandfather, um, and the... Actually, I mean, I guess I don't really need to get into that, but it sort of speaks for itself in a lot of ways. Um, I started making a lot of work that was more simple, just kind of getting it out there. I started doing um, ink drawings that were really inspired. If you're familiar with the fine artist David Shrigley, um, I didn't actually know about him when I first started doing this, but I started researching his work as I started leaning into the concept of trying to create more loose form drawings, and um, it resulted in a series that will also be published as a book in the near future. Um, it was originally my Inktober from the end of last year, but now I'm just kind of running with it. I started that style in the summer, started the Inktober, and I'm going to make it into a booklet soon. Um, I also have a lot of things from my sketchbook that I've been uploading um, that are literally just journal entries, essentially. This is my friend Zena. Um, that, I guess, is what we did that day. <laughs> um, these are two more examples from later in the year. These are all, the images I'm showing you right now are all from the lockdown period. Um, so for me, that was defined as the... March 12th is when I got sent home from work. I was in my house, essentially, except for going to the grocery store, until mid-July, I would say. And the only reason that that changed was because of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there were a lot of people that I was close to um, that were protesting and going out and doing the work of supporting their communities. And I was one of those people. Um, so that was kind of when, that's when the letter project ended, because Brian was also one of those people, and I connected with them at that time. But essentially, for the majority of it, um, I was at home. The only exceptions that were made were for people that were already out there as well. So for what that is worth, <laughs> um, this piece on the left is, um, I call that, I think I named it a quarantine portrait or um, kitchen table at lockdown. This piece is a portrait of my friend Zena and my roommate Bailey. Um, and it is that in simplicity, that was what I was trying to accomplish. But in retrospect, it's a really interesting piece. Because at the beginning of the year, basically all we were doing, um, I don't know if this is all right to say, it's legal here, but we were essentially smoking and drinking and reading the news, completely terrified, not knowing what to do. Um, I did at the time live in an apartment complex, um, my brother, my brother's partner, and one other roommate, and then Zena was also quarantined at home, and she lived about three houses away and was a friend of Bailey's, so it was basically us together every single day. Um, for my younger brother and I, that was really jarring because we'd been homeschooled K through 12. He is 20 now. He was 19 at the time. So it just left that lifestyle. I had just gone through everything I'd gone through, but suddenly we were in a new home setting that was riddled with uncertainty and any aspect of family wasn't even there because we couldn't go home and visit our parents. Um, we couldn't check in with anybody we wanted to. So this piece holds a lot of emotion for me. Um, the one on the right is obviously a play on um, the painting, This Is Not a Pipe. A Marguerite painting. Um, that translates to um, ce n'est pas un repas, which means this is not a meal. Um, this is a piece reflecting on my eating disorder because that, again, did flare up during the lockdown due to anxiety. Um, the piece on the right, um, Old Things Gone, New Things Coming, that's a two-part series, or I mean, I guess not a series, but <laughs> two pieces that go together um, that were about my leaving the MFA Boston. 
Um, that was a really emotional thing for me, even though it was a job for the reasons that I stated earlier. They were a great support system for me, and it was really helpful to be there. Um, I have, if you've listened to my podcast, you know that I have thoughts on the museum institutional world and how that's a little bit problematic in a lot of ways, but the people that I worked with directly were amazing people, and it was sad to leave. So this image on the top of the Old Things Gone image is actually from a postcard um, from the Ansel Adams show that they had in 2018, I believe, which was when I first got hired on. Um, it was the end of 2018 or the big, I think it was the end of 2018. Um, so I incorporated that and then added collage elements. Um, and on the left, uh, this is about a friend of mine um, who, she was my best friend. I worked with her and I saw her every day um, until the lockdown happened. I've only seen her once in the last year, <laughs> um, but she did, this was about, it's dated in October because that's when I drew it, but this incident happened in early April. Um, that kind of speaks for itself as well, but it's kind of an example of how I was trying to utilize text and quick drawings um, to capture emotion and almost visual journaling in a way um, and find a way to share that meaning with maybe only one or two sentences for other people versus kind of pouring out exactly what I mean to say or being so vague you can't read into it. So hopefully I accomplished that. Um, in December of 2020, I actually contracted coronavirus. Um, myself and my partner were both exposed and through, I, I don't know if you'd call this luck because it would be more lucky if we did never had it, but um, they had moved into a new apartment that happened to be set up in such a way that their bedroom was away from the rest of their roommates and they had their own bathroom. Um, well, it wasn't their own bathroom, but it was for this purpose. <laughs> um, and I was at their house when we found out that they'd been exposed. So we both got tested and I ended up staying with them. We were in a really small room and it was really strange for me because it was really similar. Not in the context of them and who they are or what our relationship dynamic was, but in terms of being stuck in a small studio apartment, not able to leave with this sense of uncertainty and nervousness, it was really triggering for me in a lot of ways. And we were both sick, didn't know what was going to happen. And again, dealing with the fact that you can't really call your mom about this, you can't call a friend, like nobody really knows what's going to happen to you. We ended up being quarantined in that room for about a month. Um, and we were able to, we had some friends drop off some care packages. My brother dropped off some care packages and took care of my cat. So it ended up fine. We're both okay now. Um, I'm actually supposed to be getting vaccinated fairly soon, which is good. But um, yeah, it was a stressful time. So these pieces are both about that. The one on the right is a little bit more obvious. That's a portrait of Brian. Um, that was also for the series that I'm going to be releasing soon in the book of black and white drawings. Um, the one on the left is titled Quarantine Self-Portrait, um, and it is symbolic in some ways of how I was feeling at the time. Um, the, yeah, I guess, I guess it sort of speaks for itself. The, what I was trying to say with the imagery was a sense of uncertainty, this limbo between life and death, um, not knowing what was going to happen, but also feeling so contained and stuck inside your own body in a lot of ways. So that was what I was trying to portray with this piece. Um, I actually painted that in Brian's room because the good thing about being quarantined with another artist is that there's a lot of paints around. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then just to touch a little bit on queerness in my art, because that is something that I didn't realize until actually preparing for this talk how much it comes up in my work, um, because I've never intentionally confronted it through my work, but I do have it in a lot of different pieces. This piece is called um, Woman From Your Dream. It's a mixed media piece on canvas probably in this room somewhere, but um, it's about two feet by three feet, and it's a collage piece. Um, it's actually, it's sort of a piece about reconciling with the fact that although maybe you're not technically in the closet, like people might know that you're queer, that doesn't mean that you yourself have embraced that, and it's not something that isn't kind of terrifying to step to sometimes. Um, this piece was about that, for however that may come across. And um, the figure in the dream is actually from someone else's dream that they told me about, and I just kind of stole her and used her in my work. Um, so there's that. And then these are two very different pieces that sort of explore um, queerness and gender. Um, this one on the right is actually behind me right now. It's a pretty large-scale um, mixed-media piece. It's mostly acrylic on canvas with some printed elements um, that were I Mod Podged onto the canvas. And then I have some flowers, some plastic flowers that I found on the street that I attached to it. Um, yeah, so the one on the right is, I called it AFAB for Assigned Female at Birth. Um, it's about gender and the ways that other people perceive you based on your gender. 
Um, I've had a lot of questions about this piece because I had it hanging in my studio for a while. It took me about four months to finish. And then when I did complete it, I brought it home and hung it in my living room <laughs> in my apartment. Um, so a lot of people have asked me if it's a self-portrait. And obviously there's a lot of imagery and pictures of myself in it. There's a picture of me as a child in the bottom right-hand corner, mirrored on the left with a picture of, it's a little dark in this scan, but a picture of a mother bird feeding a baby bird. Everything else in the image, um, I would say that image on the bottom right is the only actual depiction of me. It's supposed to capture refractions of me and the way that I see other people perceiving me and the way that people feel entitled to interact with me, which is presented in a neutral stance. Um, some of those messages are pretty awful. Some of them are really nice. Um, but the reason that I'm not, my eyes aren't shown in any of this work is because I'm not really there. This isn't about how I'm telling you that I look or how I'm telling you that I am or I'm telling you that my gender expression really is. It's somebody that sees me and doesn't think to ask more questions. This is how I see them interacting with me and this is what I'm showing you back. Um, essentially trying to create a mirror of myself. So this was one of the first pieces that I've done that was really intentionally, emotionally processing an intellectual problem that I have. Um, I've only recently started identifying as non-binary. Um, as of a few years ago, I started saying that I was gender disinterested, which was essentially me not wanting to categorize myself or not wanting to think about it too much because I had a lot on my plate. <laughs> um, but I present as a woman, I would say. Um, a lot of people read me that way, but I have over the years, I go by, I'm, my chosen name is Theodora Earthworms, but I go by Theo in personal life. Um, I can name a bunch of different ways that I've been like gender presenting in different ways, but I really, to get to the bottom of it, don't really think that any of that means anything. If my hair is long or my head is buzzed, or if I look like a boy or I look like a girl, that doesn't really mean anything at all. Um, so I identify as a person that is perceived as a woman, if that makes sense. I can refer to myself as a non-binary femme for that reason, because I think that my partner is also non-binary, but they present as a man. A lot of people read them that way. And our experiences as artists, our experiences with the general public, our experiences sometimes with even the same people are vastly different because of those things, um, especially in queer circles, which is a really interesting thing to observe. So this piece was made um, reflecting on all of those things. The screenshots of texts on all of this, um, I only edited one of them because it had my old name in it, um, but the rest of them are all completely legitimate. Um, it's just how they were. I just collected them over the course of a few months and it was just kind of a sample of the way that random people on the internet interact with me <laughs> based on what they see, which something that I kind of was trying to posit with this piece as well. Um, you can see some elements referring to social media, like the flowers on the right that kind of are representative of Twitter birds, um, and the cell phone, the moths. Um, uh, obviously, the figure in the background that is me is taking a selfie, and the, the form in the middle is also a selfie. Um, social media is also a refraction of myself. It's a version of me that I'm presenting to you with intention that then you see, perceive in the way that you will see it, and then refract it back to me in the way that you experience it. That's a lot of different social prisms that it moves through, and none of that is authentic or genuine. And I don't think that that, I, it's not a piece about me specifically, I'm using myself as an insert, but I think this is true of everyone, and I'm trying to kind of inspire that conversation. Um, especially right now in a very digital age where most of the interactions we have with other people are through Instagram or Facebook or Zoom. Um, you're not necessarily capturing the full essence of a person that way, and I think that we all feel that right now. So that's what that piece is about. Um, on the left is a much simpler <laughs> example. Um, this is from my Jean journal. Um, I did release a zine a couple of years ago that was just a full illustrated thing of my dream journal. I think it was 2017 that I did that. Um, so I'm trying to revisit that theme as well. This is also from one of my upcoming books. Um, it reads, a woman was standing at the edge of the rooftop. She was short and beautiful. A mushroom cloud exploded behind her. She didn't speak or move. Her eyes were locked on mine and she seemed very much at peace. I was terrified. And that piece is in some ways about queerness, in some ways, I don't really know what it was about because it was genuinely a dream that I had. Um, but I'm trying to explore those things as well with my work. So that's what that was. And then this is the last um, slide that I have to present to you guys. But this is a moment that happened in art school that was really pivotal for me. It was right before, either right before or right during finals week in spring of 2019, um, which, as I mentioned before, was a really transformative time for me and a really emotional time for me. And I had a class where one of my professors, her name's Ann Schaefer, I believe, um, at Lesley University. Um, the class was Art of the Islamic World, and she asked us for our final to do a speech and to make a piece of art that represents um, some theme that had to do with uh, Islam. 
And what I was prompted with was um, Sufism. So I was trying to make a sculpture that synthesized this entire um, religious practice that I had just learned about in class. (laughs) Um, I didn't know very much about it. I didn't feel like I was an authority on it by any means, but I really wanted to do well in this assignment and I really wanted to show that I was trying to understand. So I did a lot of research and I went really deep on it and um, ended up making a woven sculpture. I built a loom by myself in woodshop and then used um, white wool to weave this piece. Um, It's just sort of a fiber arts piece that didn't have an intended theme, but was very process focused. Um, I was just trying to go with it and think about it and really connect with the material. And I was reflecting on the material while I was making it. Um, And I don't remember the full list of things that I put in my speech, but it had about 20 reasons why there was symbolism woven into this project. And then when I went to present it, I gave this whole speech and I thought I was doing so well. I thought I nailed it. And right at the end, my professor said, that's all very good, but how would the audience know? that this is about Sufism. And I thought in that moment that I failed. I thought that I completely blew the exam. And I was just like, after everything that had happened to me in the last two weeks, I at the time was couch surfing. She didn't know that, of course. Um, Trying to stop smoking weed every single day, all day long. Had come to class completely sober, really worked so hard and still thought I'd bombed it. So I just said, they can't. (laughs) And she said, that is the best answer you could have given me. It's okay if your intended audience is yourself. And I don't think she knew how much of a gift that was for me to hear at that time. Um, So I put that in this project, and that is what I am hoping to leave you with. And that's it. So if you guys have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them, I guess. Hi, do you have any advice on how how to not be as much of a perfectionist when it comes to making art? Um, I relate a lot to not finishing sketches out of being discouraged of it not looking good to me? Uh, um, So this is a tough one because I think something I do want to kind of highlight or reiterate is that I believe these things very strongly, but putting them into practice is an intentional and difficult thing to do. Um, I am still very much perfectionist. I have a lot of pieces that I don't post, but I've been trying to kind of come out of that. Um, I also maybe would be wary... um, of sharing everything you make because social media is a whole other minefield. But um, in terms of not finishing a sketch, I think I would just think about the artists that you know and the people that you are friends with and make work and think about if you've ever had a moment where you thought that their work wasn't good enough or you shouldn't have shown me that, that wasn't great. Because, I mean, we all have, like, mean thoughts sometimes, but I think majority of the time, most people wouldn't think that about somebody else. And it's really easy to think about yourself. It's kind of the same thing as feeling like you're ugly because you looked at other people's Instagram photos all day where they're all made up and they look great. Um, just make sure that you're not comparing it to other people's finished product and compare it to your last work and the things that you want to do and the things that you want to present. Um, And even if it doesn't live up to that standard, maybe somebody else will look at it and really enjoy it because you're kind of just putting this expression out into the world. The meaning is different for everybody that looks at it, which is a good thing and a bad thing, I think. So I don't know if that really helps, but (laughs) you probably won't stop feeling the way that you do, but overcoming it is an intentional practice that will benefit you in the long run. (laughs) I say to remind myself also. I have a question. Sure. Um, So... What have you found to be the most beneficial to your art practice? Is it art school, mentorships, um, community building, uh, etc.? Yeah, um, it's interesting because I feel like it's been a mod podge of all of it. Um, I have been very lucky in the sense that I did have a lot of people that I was family friends that I grew up with that were working artists, which is a pretty unique situation. Um, So I did experience some one-on-one mentorship from a lot of them. Um, Talking to my friends and now my partner, but my best friend for a while, um, and a lot of other people has been something that's really been beneficial. I don't, I'm really, really hesitant to knock art school because I don't think that it's a bad thing to do. Um, I just think that it comes with some problems if you're a low-income person or if you're working full-time in terms of scheduling and being able to afford it. It's part of the reason why I haven't been back because of student loans and things. Um, especially if you're a person with mental health issues or if you have trouble with deadlines, it can be hard. But my background taught me, if anything, that um, alternative education comes in a lot of forms. 
Um, Virago Collective is one example. It's defunct now, but hopefully we can bring it back in the future. But it's something that technically it was my and my roommate's idea, but we didn't really bring anything unique to the table. It was just a bunch of people doing their best that were talking about doing their best. Um, and that can be formed anywhere. Like you could start that right now. Um, and I think that art school, one of the biggest benefits of art school is having that community and also having mentorship in professionals in the field and professors who can give you information you wouldn't have been able to find on your own. But if you really do the legwork and you try to seek out those connections, you can also establish that on your own. I think finding what works for you is a pretty individual mission um, based on where you feel like you need support. But I think at the end of the day, the answer is just to be brave and to do it, <laughs> to see the ways that you can. Send an email to someone who you think isn't going to answer you or apply to the job you think you're not going to get because you might surprise yourself. So I guess in short, combining as much as you can. Information from everywhere <laughs> is the best way. I think, yeah, just the biggest lesson that I learned from Virago was when I left art school, I thought that I was cutting myself off from the art world and that the only way I'd be able to tap into it again was my job. And then finding out that sales isn't the same as being a sponsored artist or <laughs> having your your actual work shown versus supporting the institution. Um, I felt kind of cut off for a while and little did I know all of the people that ended up teaching me all of the lessons that I needed to learn at the time, I had already known for a few months. Um, I think there's a lot of tendency to sort of glamorize the fine arts world or making it or um, earning a lot of money doing what you do because that would be great. <laughs> We'd all love to be able to pay our rent by painting. Um, but the nitty gritty of it, um, this is a sort of a cliche. I think I've said this in the podcast too, but when people talk about artists like um, uh, just the big name famous ones, like Andy Warhol, what Andy Warhol did with the factory, he had the money to create a space like that and to support other artists and give them a platform. But really that's a community effort. That was a grassroots kind of collective that he formed um, and that other people contributed their work to. There wasn't anybody there that had anything that was unattainable. It was just kind of an alliance between these people and kind of creating a place where they could come and go. Um, obviously, if you get into the history of that, that was rife with toxicity, but <laughs> if you could do it the right way, it would be great and it would be easy. Um, it would just be about dedication. Um, and when you think about artists like, um, Vincent van Gogh, for example, is a really good one because he was an alcoholic, he was mentally ill, um, he didn't have gallery connections, his work wasn't really seen for a really long time, um, he died pretty young, but he was making beautiful work the whole time. Um, he was able to tap into the things that we look at now and we think he was a genius, he was so amazing, but you might walk by someone like Vincent van Gogh on the street and not look at them twice. Um, the seed of what your art is, is honesty and dedication to whatever it is you're trying to make. If you're trying to send a specific message, if you're trying to just teach something to yourself, if you're trying to work through a process, if you're trying to represent something in terms of realism, if you're trying to go through abstraction, whatever it is, you're using your education and utilizing these tools to further your own work and to strengthen your own voice. But that voice starts with you. That's already there. You just have to keep nurturing that. So, yeah. I'm not sure what my point was with that, but <laughs> I feel very strongly about that. It's something that I, in the past, have not believed and have a tendency to question myself on, but every time that I end up leaning into it again, I find some pretty amazing things and have met some pretty amazing people. So there is another question. Um, Perfect. What, what has been the most fulfilling artistic achievement of yours thus far into your career? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um... I think every time that I achieve something new, I feel completely overwhelmed by it. Um, I was very excited about doing this art talk, for example. Um, there's a video, I think it's still on my Instagram, which I've left it up for transparency if you scroll back way far, of the first time I got into an art market, which I paid to be in, but it was selective judging. I literally broke down crying. It was on the floor of my apartment, so excited and amazed that I got into this and managed to do it. Um, so in terms of what's most fulfilling, I think... I think Virago Collective is pretty fulfilling because um, I wouldn't necessarily call that my achievement, but it taught me and the people in my group a lot. Um, we kind of realized that we didn't need to, you don't have to work 70 hours a week to pay all this money to do something and get accolades from other people. 
that helps you and there it's definitely a legitimate way to advance your career but it's not the only way and I think that was something I didn't really understand and I felt like I was locked out of this world if I didn't get the scholarship or didn't get straight A's or didn't stay in school <laughs> which at some point became unattainable for me um so I think just every single time that I realized that I had the capacity to do what I wanted to do and was able to show that to other people was very fulfilling um not necessarily showing my own worth to other people, but showing their own worth to them or helping them understand that. Um, that's what I ultimately want to do. That's why I was pursuing a career in art therapy and arts-based research is because in the future, I would love to be able to make that my actual day job. And then there's another question. Uh, hi, would you mind talking more about the collaborative letter art you and your partner made? How did you come up with that idea? What inspired you to, to exchange art like that? I really love that you two made art like that. Uh, it's so intimate and inspiring. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, well, this is, I mean, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say this, but I guess it's not really corny. But we met um, on New Year's Eve and we hung out for about a half an hour. But to be honest, I, which this sounds so awful now because I didn't know a global pandemic was coming, but I was sick. So <laughs> I didn't... Um, I didn't really remember what happened at the end of the night because I was super tired. I think I fell asleep on the couch. So technically we met then. Um, but we'd been familiar with each other's work because we ran in similar circles. And I think I followed their Instagram. Um, and we talked about art before, but never really beyond like nuts and bolts, fine arts history. Like maybe we'll meet at a museum and it never happened kind of. And then one day, I think I messaged them and asked them if they'd want to watch a documentary with me on Zoom. Um, because they, I, most of my roommates weren't artists. Um, a couple of them, I had one roommate who was a photographer and my brother is a writer. Um, but they're different practices. Like no, nobody else really cared about like Renaissance paintings or like Dutch still life or whatever. So this was a person that I didn't really know very well and a new friend I could make in these weird circumstances. So we exchanged phone numbers and we called each other, um, thinking it was going to be like a half an hour networking conversation. And it ended up being a couple of hours. And we watched the documentary, um, The Artist is Present, um, which was made about the artist, uh, she's a performance artist, Marina Abramovic, which, as a side note, performance art is a great example of process art. Um, and that exam that um, show was a great example as well, because she was involving the viewer in the process. If you're not familiar, um, I talk about this in my podcast for a while, actually, it's coming out today, if it's not up already, but um, she essentially sat at a table in MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, and looked into the eyes of one person at a time for about, I think, five minutes. Um, and it really caused a lot of people to have a lot of emotions. And in that documentary, also, she talks about um, her relationship she had over the years a long while ago. She's in her 70s now, I believe, but at the time she was in her 20s, 30s, 40s with the artist Ule, who's also a performance artist. Um, and they were in a relationship and they made a lot of art together. And it was really interesting thinking about when you get to know a person and when you talk to someone, you do kind of create this friendship, which you as one separate entity and they as one separate entity might go about life one way. But when you're together, that bond is almost a third entity. Like you act in a different way. It's a different social face, which that's a whole other topic. But um, that is a concept in psychology and sociology is that kind of blending, that union of two people is a very unique like no relationship you have with anybody else is the same as that one experience which is kind of the cornerstone of my belief in polyamory as well um so we were talking about a lot of that um and they asked if i wanted to make art with them we were thinking about the idea of um that kind of blend and we decided to do it through the mail because we couldn't see each other in person um maybe if it were different circumstances we wouldn't have even met but this was how this came to be um, so we got off the phone, both of us made five drawings. Um, they were just literally like number two pencil on printer paper because we were at home. Um, and put them in the mail, sent them to each other. And then we both received the envelopes, we both added on top. And then put them in the mail, sent them back. And we started, around this time, we were talking on the phone every night, but we banned each other from discussing what we put in the envelopes. Um, at one point, um, I actually, this is kind of weird, but... They sent me one, and I was living with my younger brother at the time, who, um, he, we're very close, he loves me very much, but he makes fun of me sometimes, because I'm coming from different creative worlds, 
And um, I received an envelope from Brian that was, it had been a drawing of a person, and then they actually cut off a chunk of their own hair and glued it to the page and sent it back to me. And I opened the letter in my living room. My brother saw me doing it. And he was like, oh my gosh, Theo, you can't send that to this person. They're not going to want to talk to you again. And I was like, they sent this to me. And he was like, okay, bye. (laughs) I'm going in the other room now. Um, Which it just, we realized that we connected a lot in this kind of third element of like this blending of personality, but also blending of art styles um, in a way that we couldn't have maybe come across if it was a planned intentional thing. And it really just was a result of sharing the process. So it's interesting. And then over the course of the months, um, we started actually dating. Um, they had a primary partner at that point and that relationship ended and we went through a lot of things. Um, I think it touches on um, protests, Black Lives Matter movement, um, coronavirus lockdown, uh, the uncertainty of when you were going to be able to see other people again, the uncertainty of if we'd ever be able to meet face to face. We didn't even know if that would be possible. Um, so it kind of was a conversation about the things we didn't want to talk about on the phone and the things that we wouldn't actually say in black and white or you wouldn't write in a text, but maybe you can see it in retrospect through the nuance of these images. The reason it's taking so long to put into a book is because we now have to write a foreword explaining all of that. (laughs) Um, It'll be coming soon. We're almost done with it, I think. So thank you so much, everyone, for having me. It was really nice to be able to talk about this stuff. (laughs) If nobody else has questions, uh, I think this is a good time to stop. Uh, It's already one one o'clock so <laughs> yeah thank you everyone for coming yeah, it thank means you. a lot and thank you Theodora yeah thank you so much for having me and hearing my stories <laughs> how many people are saying thank you in the chat <laughs> I know it's really nice it is really nice